Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. I wanted to ask whether someone may have an explanation to what I could have encountered. I was walking home from work yesterday after dusk, yet it was still somewhat light outside, as during these times in Denmark, the light persists for quite long and at three separate occasions encountered or heard something strange that I cannot fully comprehend or explain logically. The first one was a 50 centimeter tall guesstimate shadowy or dark bipedal figure running at high speed away from me, which I only saw in the corner of my eye and did not pay much attention to. 300 meters further, I saw what at first appeared to be human in dark clothes walking around 20, 30 meters in front of me. But when I took a better look, it seemed like it was just legs up to around knee height. After I realized what I have seen and could not make any logical conclusion of it, it turned to the left and walked through a tree line, after which it seemed to have switched to four legs and disappeared by the time I walked where it had been standing previously. What's even weirder is the fact that there is nowhere to hide in that area, and I had clear vision of where it should have gone and even checked where it went into the tree line. It vanished. At this point, I felt eerie and creeped out, as there usually are not many people walking around. But it happens, though they always stay fully visible and never disappear. The third time was almost at my house door, where I have heard rustling and movements in bushes, where cats usually hide, but they don't make such loud noises. The thing that I saw disappear into the tree line somewhat resembled a Fresno night crawler, but it had human legs and was dark, black, shadowy. This was in Copenhagen metropolitan area, if it helps anyhow. I paddled about 240 miles up a river in Canada a few years back. It gets to a point where you end up being completely alone in the wild with no civilization to be found anywhere. So we had a couple of interesting encounters. Both of the ones that really stick out happened at night. One of the first nights we're out there, I'm sleeping in my tent, comfy as can be. All of a sudden, I feel a big snout poking my head through the tent and sniffing. I didn't know what it was and that it dawned on me. A black bear got curious and decided to sniff around the campsite, and he ended up sniffing my face for like three minutes. I didn't want to move because I didn't want to startle him, so I was just lying there as this bear sticks his nose in my face and starts huffing. I swear I almost shit myself. The second encounter had the potential to be scary, but I was too busy stifling laughter to really feel fear. One of the last nights we were out there, we decided to set up camp on a little beach. It seemed like a good spot, but after we set up camp, I'm walking around and I notice some moose tracks in the sand. We had set up camp on a little moose watering hole. No big deal. I'm sleeping in my tent and I hear heavy footprints outside. Sick, a moose. Cool beans. I slowly open my tent zipper, as quiet as possible so I wouldn't scare the thing. I'm super excited to see my first moose, except I didn't see the moose. At least not the whole thing. All I saw was this bull's giant dick dangling down maybe three feet in front of my face. I recently moved into a new home. Since moving here, I felt my entire bed vibrating low frequency, moderate amplitude, nothing like a phone vibration, more like driving five miles per hour over rumble strips on a highway, but silent three times now. My partner was over one night and woke me up to ask why the bed was vibrating because they felt it. I did too at that point and I was just like, I don't know, maybe the train that is about a mile away was just the right mass and speed to induce a resonance in the hill my home is on. But that's all I can come up with. Hasn't happened in a couple of months, but I keep waiting for it to happen so I can run outside to see if I can hear the train and confirm the hypothesis. I have checked seismograph records online and came up with nothing. The frequency and amplitude of the vibrations don't seem to correspond to anything, so that train thing is all I've got. The floor isn't vibrating when this is occurring, making it even more strange. There are no major roads and no construction for miles. 
No underground drainage here either since I'm in the county. I have an Ikea bed frame with the drawers under it, and no, there are no vibrating toys in them. Only clothing. Any ideas? This is an account of an incident that happened in 1974 when I was 15 years old living in the city of Puebla, Mexico with my family. On this day, my younger sister Janet, she was 14, her best friend, Shay also an American living in Puebla, and I were gathering in the afternoon so we could take a bus together to the city of Coyula to make clay for art class. While Janet and I were walking around the block to pick up Shay at her house, we saw an American man appearing to be in his mid to late thirties, walking in the opposite direction of us on the other side of the street. He was carrying a large duffel bag over his shoulder. Janet and I started speaking loudly in English, hoping we would get his attention, but to no avail. When we arrived at Shay's house, we insisted that she hurry for the possibility of catching up with that guy. By the time she was finally ready, we were sure we would have missed him. But instead, he was in the same place where we saw him last. We already told Shay about this guy, and after seeing him now and walking in the same direction, we all spoke up loudly in English, hoping again to get his attention. This time it worked. From across the street, he yelled to us, Do you speak English? He crossed the street to the side we were on and told us he was looking for a specific address taking out a piece of paper where the address was written and showing it to us. We did not recognize the street name. It was a long Aztec name beginning with a letter T. Since we were on Tehuacan Street, he thought the street we were on was the same street, but it was not. We decided to walk him to the house number on Tehuacan Street that he had on his paper. While walking to that address, each of us would think different things, especially lots of questions and he would look at each of us and answer our thoughts out loud. He was reading our minds. For instance, I thought to myself, I wonder what his name is, and he would look at me and reply, Richard. Janet said she was wondering where he was from, and he turned to Janet and just said, Santa Barbara, California. Of course, I didn't know why he looked at Janet and said that, but I was catching on quickly to understand that he read our minds as none of us said a word, and he just answered our thought questions while facing the person who had the thought. At one point he looked directly at Shay and said that she shouldn't worry about James Shay's boyfriend, and that he, James wouldn't be jealous. Later Shay said she was worried about what James might think about the situation of joining this attractive guy. We arrived at the house that had that number he had on his paper. It was in the direction of where we were going to catch the bus to Colula. Because he did not know any Spanish, we spoke with the maid who answered the door at that house. The maid said that this was not the house he was looking for, and the people who lived there were not the people Richard was looking for, and she closed the door. Richard continued addressing our thoughts, and after the door closed, I said out loud, Hey, we probably have a map at our house. It was an apartment and could find the address from there. As you might have gathered by now, we shay, Janet and I abandoned the journey to Colula to make clay. Everyone agreed that this was a good idea, so we turned back and walked to our apartment. Once there, Richard, Shay, and Janet were joined at the dining room table by my sister, Louise, the eldest of us three. Our maid, Anna, met Richard, as did my mother, and Anna, and later my mother, pulled me aside and chased me for bringing a stranger to our home. When my mother confronted me, I replied that she wasn't living her Christian values. If she thought it was all right to put a person out who needed help, I sometimes was a sassy kid. It turned out we didn't have a map at our home, so I ran around the apartment building asking neighbors if they had one. No one did. I went to the ground floor beauty shop and asked the ladies in there, and no one had one, nor had they heard of the street. One beautician suggested we take a bus, and before getting on, asked the bus driver if they knew of the street, because she said bus drivers know the city and her streets best. All the time I was running around, Richard, both my sisters Louise and Janet Shea, and my mother were sitting around the round dining room table. I would stop by periodically to give them updates. During one of these updates, I noticed that Richard had poured out a bunch of salt from the salt shaker, 
and in front of him, he had formed a pyramid, complete with four flat sides and a pointed top. I remember looking at that and thinking it was odd, but was more focused on trying to find a map for Richard. Later Anna commented to me that he was rude to make such a mess on the table with the salt. Since no one in the building had a map, we took the advice of going to a bus stop and asking a bus driver about the address. We went to the bus stop that was around the corner, on the street where Shay lived and where we first found Richard. That bus stop was across the street from a park that normally was crowded with people, but was totally empty when we got there. Richard, Shay, Janet, and I waited at that corner for the buses. Buses in a Mexican city are plentiful, and they would come by about every five minutes or so. When the buses arrived and stopped, I took the written address and asked the bus driver if they knew the street. Five buses went by in all. A couple of the bus drivers replied that if the spelling and the name were changed, they might know the street, while all the others said there was no such street. I had thought that I would continue with Richard to his destination as I have said before, he was attractive. In a little bit, you will see why this is significant. After the fifth bus left, we stood there quietly. Shay, Janet, and I were facing Richard and the empty park behind him, while Richard was facing the opposite way, with his back to the park. His duffel bag was on the ground next to him. We were all silent, and then suddenly, poof, in a split second, a large, old-time taxi-looking bomb of a car appeared right before our eyes. No engine sound, facing the wrong direction on a one-way street, and just behind Richard. We Shay, Janet, and I were totally flabbergasted, breathless, in total shock. The car appeared old, with a splotchy green paint job, light green, with faded areas here and there. Directly after it appeared a man who looked and sounded exactly like Alfred Hitchcock, seated in the driver's seat, and having his elbow out the open window resting his arm there said, Young man, are you looking for tea? Street? He said the exact name of the street that no one had heard of before. His voice was totally Alfred Hitchcock's voice, too. Immediately Richard picked up his duffel bag, turned around and said, Yes, I am. At that, Alfred Hitchcock closed his hands together as in prayer, then opened them with a map opening between his hands. He said to Richard, This is where we are, and this is where we're going, pointing out the places on the map. Richard was leaning towards Alfred Hitchcock and getting this information, and they continued talking to each other. Shay leaned against the car to catch her breath, as we were all so blown away by the car and Alfred Hitchcock's appearance. Janet sharply told Shay to stop leaning on the car, because if it disappeared like it appeared, she would be flat on her back in the street. Shay stopped leaning. At about that point, Richard picked up his duffel bag, walked around the front of the car, threw his duffel bag in the car, and right before he got in the passenger seat, looked at me and asked, Don't you want to come? I said an emphatic no. He said okay, got in the seat, and then the car, with no engine motor sounds, turned the corner towards Shay's house, and while it was turning Alfred Hitchcock said loudly to us, Have a nice trip, see you in the funny papers. I had never before had heard the expression of, See you in the funny papers. As soon as the car straightened onto the street, the car, with Alfred Hitchcock and Richard in it, disappeared immediately, as quickly as it had first shown up. We Shay, Janet, and I were so freaked out that we all started running towards our home in a frantic state. But at one point we all stopped, gathered together, kind of hugging each other and feeling like deer in headlights. When we were together like that, we heard all around us, especially above us, Alfred Hitchcock's voice laughing and laughing. After a minute or two of that low, sinister laugh, it stopped, and we felt released and ran on. For the past almost 50 years, I have kept my eyes open to anything that might explain the incident. Janet and I have told the story through the years we have not been in touch with Shay, so I don't know if she has spoken of it since we all left Mexico. I've asked many people what they thought, and only once when I went to a seance that a friend had organized, did the medium tell me it was an alien abduction when I explained the experience to her after she did a reading of the group? That never felt right to me, but I don't know. 
In 2008, I ran across a Reuters article on the torture of sleep deprivation that shamed our country in Gitmo with terrorist prisoners. I was teaching Introduction to Psychology and a course called The Psychology of Dreams at our nearby university. So I read much about sleep, dreams, and the effect sleep deprivation has on the psyche. The article was about the sleep deprivation of Bin Laden's driver, Salem Hamden. The article described how Hamden was tortured by being deprived of sleep for 50 days. I read on and was blown away when I read two paragraphs in that article that stood out for me. The first read, they also said the records indicated Hamden and other prisoners at the remote detention camp in southeastern Cuba were visited by someone called Alfred Hitchcock, apparently over the British master of psychological thriller films who died in 1980. Later in the article under the heading, Who was Alfred Hitchcock? It read, Defense lawyers said they were curious about the meaning of entries in the documents that Alfred Hitchcock had visited Hamden and other prisoners. Who Alfred Hitchcock is, I have no idea, said Navy Lieutenant Commander Brian Miser, a defense lawyer. It's obviously a code name for something. I have not found any further strange information about Alfred Hitchcock, but the incident that happened to us happened in 1974, and Alfred Hitchcock was alive at that time. I don't think I ever thought it was the real Alfred Hitchcock, nor a ghost of one, but a duplicate in some strange way. This entire incident was experienced by my sister, Janet, her friend, Shay, and me, while several other witnesses were a part of the experience at certain points. My older sister, Louise, my mother, and our maid, Anna, met Richard and witnessed some of his strange behaviors reading minds and making a pyramid out of salt. I would just like to know if anyone out there has any idea what it may have been about. I had most of my out-of-science experiences there in Publa, and I have always wondered if it is a place where magical types of things happen. Even when I go back to visit my older sister, nephew, and his family, I have strange things happen, so I don't think it was a thing of youth, but rather of place. That is interesting to me. I am a licensed professional counselor LPCS and educator in Texas with three master's degrees. My sister Janet is a veterinarian and a paramedic here in Texas, and my sister Louise has a PhD and teaches at a university in Mexico. I think we could be considered credible. About 10-12 years ago, I remember going fishing with a friend around my family's property in rural South Dakota. I was 14 or 15 at the time and had my learner's permit we can drive earlier in SD, so I took our small farm truck down to our creek with my friend. I grew up on a farm and the creek we let our cattle drink from was often full of fish. While fishing, a neighbor of mine drove by and said hi. We had some normal fishing small talk and he asked if we would like to try fishing his creek on his property. We hadn't had much luck so my friend and I said we would give it a shot. We followed him to his creek and he told us we could keep whatever we caught if we wanted. He noticed we also had a 17 HMR rifle with us. We always have one in our truck in case we had predators around livestock and such. He mentioned he had some badgers digging holes around his stock. Damn, and if we saw one, he would be all right. If we got rid of it so his cattle didn't injure a leg walking to the water. We packed up our stuff and walked down the short dirt road to the creek. The creek was to the east of us and ran in the north or south direction. On the south side of the road, there was a hill formed from dirt when the stock dam was dug out for his cattle. And the creek ran into the dam on the other side. We went to the mouth of the dam where the creek led in and fished for a while, noticing it was eerily quiet. Normally, there would be a lot of noise on a night like this. No wind in South Dakota means you will be nearing all sorts of bugs, frogs, etc. But there was absolutely nothing. We thought that was strange, but fishes anyway. We were catching a lot of decent-sized fish. My friend was planning to stay at my house for a couple days, so we decided we would keep a few to fry up the next day for lunch. To do this, we needed our net and stronger to keep the fish. Since it was a short walk, we left our poles where they were. There were no fish big enough to pull them in and walked back to the truck quick. 
On the way back, we heard some trashing on the opposite side of the hill mentioned earlier. This was odd because we were just on that side while fishing. When we reached the opposite end, we looked to see if a badger had been there like my neighbor mentioned. There was nothing, but we could see where something had knocked down some cattails and other straw-type grass. What was weird was that way more seemed to be knocked down than what a badger could do and none had been knocked down while we were on the other side just minutes earlier. Either way, we continued back to get our net and stringer. This time on our way back, keep in mind the road from truck to fishing spot is probably 100 feet if that. We heard what sounded like a huge bird flapping around in the same spot as the thrashing. The only large birds we have in that area are vultures, hawks, eagles, and owls. I've seen and heard all of these birds up close before. This sounded much larger and the flapping was way more sporadic and quick than any of those birds move their wings. It was very eerie and we started to get a little scared. We decided to hustle back to where we were fishing to try and see what it was. When we got there, however, again there was nothing. We looked at each other and mentioned how weird it was and joked that it freaked us out a little. Then we noticed something had moved out fishing poles. The two poles had swapped places. At first I thought my head was playing tricks until we saw our lawn chairs. This confirmed something switched the poles because they were sitting near the foot of the opposite chairs now. This really started freaking us out so we decided to start packing up and leave. As we were packing up, we started to hear a noise coming from the second dirt hill on the opposite side of the pond. Most ponds are dug such that there are two dirt hills on either side. There were cattails and reeds leading around the water to the other hill where the creek exited the stock dam. Now we could hear footsteps coming from the other side of the hill. We thought maybe it was my neighbor, but then we heard a combination of noises that scared the absolute hell from us. We heard the thrashing from before coupled with the flapping and a new noise. This was like a growling or snarling noise which made no sense. I have heard coyotes, foxes, badgers, opossums, and all other manner of animal I grew up with growl or snarl at some point. This sounded like none and the footsteps were large and heavy, like a bipedal animal, not soft and swift like a coyote. By now we were absolutely terrified. I grabbed the gun and we sprinted back to the truck. It was getting dark at this point. I told my friend to drive since I had the gun. We got in, he turned the headlights on, and we could see the splashing coming from the stock dam from where the truck was parked. We wanted to try and get a better look at what was splashing around, but were too scared. My friend backed us into the road and we sped home with me clutching the gun the whole way. We never told anyone what happened and have only mentioned it to each other once to this day. Does anyone have any clue what it could have been? To this day I still get eerie when driving around the back roads near home. Edit. So someone has asked about my grandpa's UFO story so I will share that as well. It's nothing spectacular as far as UFOs go but still interesting in my eyes. I was very, very young when this happened. My mother had been divorced for just a couple years and had been working a lot. After she divorced, she moved us back home with my grandparents. She saved up some money and decided to take my siblings and I on a little family outing for a few days to the Black Hills of South Dakota. I want to say this was around the 4th of July, but I am not going to say I know that for sure. While gone, my grandfather, grandmother deceased, and dogged girl but deceased, were sitting on our porch around nine at night. Our deck on the house faced the west, and they were looking outward. I would like to add that there was zero visual obstruction as they were facing a field with zero trees in sight. Our dog began barking and growling. It was not totally out of character, as she did this to predators that would venture close to the livestock or poultry. What was strange is my grandparents could not see anything around. As if from nowhere, they saw the UFO materialize almost instantaneously in the sky over our pasture. Our dog continued barking and my grandparents stood awestruck. My grandfather described the UFO as four large lights arranged in a vertical fashion with four smaller lights, orbiting it in a figure-eight sort of pattern. He said it seemed relatively close to the ground. 
but it never made any noise and there was never any dust lifted from the ground from a propulsion source. This was before camera phones were popular and so my grandfather ran inside to get our camcorder. When he returned, it disappeared. My grandfather said that my grandmother saw it dart off into the night sky. My grandparents were completely flabbergasted by what happened. Having no idea what they had just seen, the consulted books our family actually had a very large assortment of books. To avail through that they turned to the internet. I can't imagine trying to research something like this, I'm on dial-up in the late 90s, but nonetheless they found similar images with UFO headlines. My grandparents were very religious and never entertained the idea of something like this until they saw one probably part of the reason my grandfather was so apprehensive about sharing with others. He would not believe it himself had he been told. After this, they were very open to the idea of the paranormal and still maintained their faith. They just accepted that there were things they could explain through their religion and accepted that. They actually would watch a lot of programs on TV about paranormal stuff, which got me interested early on. I would also like to add, my grandfather is a very credible man. He served as a U.S. Army Ranger in Vietnam and worked on a lot of covert operations. He was relatively high up towards the end of his active duty career. We have several photos of him in the Pentagon, some talking with who I believe was the Secretary of Defense at the time. Not 100% sure, but I know was a high-ranking official. At this time, my grandfather was still actively working with the recruiting office at our local National Guard base. He had a very good idea of aircraft capabilities of most types of aircraft from when he served all the way to the time he saw the UFO. He has seen, shot out of, and been shot at by all manner of aerial weaponry. Nothing he has seen had maneuvering capabilities like what he saw, or the ability to stay silent while maintaining low-level flight, and cause no ground disturbance from the propulsion system. He also claimed that had something been flying the craft, it would have to have been very small. A humanoid creature would have to be roughly the size of a child to adequately move in the craft. I've never seen a UFO, and I guess I've never technically outright seen a humanoid being, but I have had a strange encounter that is unexplainable by conventional means, and I believe my grandfather did as well, albeit a different type of encounter. I live in a small wood cabin on a farm in the countryside of Catalonia, Spain. Usually shared with one other person, I had a few weeks alone. Never lock the door, hot weather means bedroom window is open, although wooden shutters are closed with thin gaps to outside. Pitch black surroundings. I had one of those nights where it's hard to sleep. Around 4 a.m., I hear screaming in the distance. There are around five typically sized fields between cabin and the village. I'll hoe this as far, I assume it's someone in the village messing around. Goes quiet. Starts again, this time it's clear that the person is screaming something. Although not a native to the area, I know this isn't language, it's gibberish. He is screaming words that completely don't make sense, and that I've found it impossible to imitate since, and he's screaming them angrily. I'm on edge now, but I tell myself it's a drunk person on their way home in the night. Half an hour later I've calmed down and it's been quiet for quite a while. Then I hear the voice again. This time there is no screaming. I can hear them speaking the gibberish at a normal level. This means that they are within the property. I freeze too frightened to go lock my front door. The front door area has a lot of windows and I'm afraid to see them, them to see me and instead stare at my bedroom door, with a plan to barricade should I hear someone entering the cabin. The muttering fades away just as the sun begins to rise. I lock my door now. Back in 27 on the USS Kitty Hawk, we had a shipmates throwing chem lights over the side of ship randomly. The skipper required every sponson to be manned at night, I had a balls to four watch. I didn't see a chem light, but I happened to see a bright blue light coming from underneath the surface about 100 meters away. From the hull of the ship, it looked like it was 30 meters in diameter. It disappeared instantly. 
About five minutes later, it came back moving slowly towards the ship. A bunch others saw it this time and called it in to the OOD officer of the deck. It then moved away from the ship underwater at an insane speed. I still to this day believe it was a USO, unidentified submerged object. I'm 52 and have lived in the US. Now for 12 years. Forgive me if my English isn't the best. It's not my first language. I lived in Puerto Rico most of my life and even served as law enforcement there for about eight years. I know what I saw, so here it goes. I remember it being a Sunday night, a couple of days before the arrival of Hurricane Maria to the island. I was patrolling my tour alone. Everybody else was sent home early. And due to the approaching hurricane conditions, the weather that night wasn't anything special and just very cloudy with some rain. I had heard on multiple occasions about chupacabra sightings in Puerto Rico, especially around the rainforest, which is right where I was during that time. One elderly neighbor lady said she had actually encountered one when she stayed late at work one night, apparently running out of gas. She claimed it looked like a small person with spikes on its back, red glowing eyes and large fangs. She said it chased after her, and she had to get into her car and try to get away even though she just barely had enough gas to do it. Just a fair warning, what I'm about to describe isn't pleasant, so be warned. It was around 1.30 a.m., and I had just passed a local river when a thing walked right by the road. It actually popped its head up. It didn't even try to hide or anything. At first glance, I didn't know what it was, and I thought maybe it was a small animal. But as soon as it fully turned and looked into my headlights and hissed, you could see what it was. Chupacabra. Very skinny, spines on its back, large red eyes, very pale skin, and sharp teeth and fangs. It was the red eyes, though, that ultimately gave it away before I saw the rest of its body. Those eyes are so bright, they could pierce the darkness of the night, even through my headlights. This might sound silly to you, but at that point I froze and felt something was wrong especially when it hissed at me like some kind of rabid wild animal. Also, it's important to know that most Puerto Rican people are very religious. So if somebody is walking around out there and they see this thing, chances are they're going to think it's a demon or something from the realm of hell. There was no doubt about it in my mind that night that what I was seeing was a chupacabra. It disappeared soon after. This has been one of the most frightening experiences I've ever had on the job and I've never seen or heard of such a thing here on American soil. Thank you for taking the time to read. Good morning, as I sit reading this article. It amazes me that no one caught one of these things yet. I understand that if something with a 25-30 feet wingspan flies past you, you're not going to grab your camera as a first instinct. My son and I saw this thing in the summer of 2010 in Merchtown, Pennsylvania. We were parked on the side of the road in a heavily wooded area when this thing casually glided up the road. It looked big enough to carry a full-grown man away with no effort. When the winged thing flew over the hood of my car, we instantly ducked down. This thing had a round human-sized head with no beak and huge bat-like wings. Now I would never tell this story if it wasn't for my 16-year-old son sitting in the back seat who also witnessed it on that summer day. I'm a pretty capable guy, not too many things can shake me, but this thing scared me. Here is what I saw. The body was 5-6 feet in length accessible. The wingspan was 25-30 feet easy, no feathers, bat-like skin, jet black, and a 4-5 feet skinny rat or dragon-like tail that stuck straight out. This thing didn't fly like a bird, it glided about 10 feet off the ground at a plodding speed. After 50-75 feet of gliding, it took one huge flap of the wings, never changing elevation, and glided up the road till it disappeared into the woods. I'm convinced this thing lives underground, probably near some sort of hot spring because it has no feathers. Well, that's my story. Feel free to reply with any questions, that 45-second event will forever be etched into memory. I say we find it and catch it. I would love to see it again up close.
So this is something that I'm still experiencing to this day. Like, literally as I'm typing this. I'm just gonna start at the beginning. I live in a rural area surrounded by woods and that's about it. A few years after moving here, me and my father started hearing things in the woods at night. It started off just sounding like an animal until we both heard what sounded like a little girl saying hello. When looking around with my father, no one was found. This continued for years, but never to this extent. A few months ago, I was walking home from taking up the trash. It was around 9 p.m. and dark. As I walked, I could hear something following me in the woods next to me. I assumed it was just a squirrel or something until I heard laughing directly in my ear, loud. I was unable to run due to a mild leg injury at the time, so I just called my mom as I walked home. Nothing else happened that night. After that, our dogs would start barking like crazy every night at around that same time. Then, starting a few months ago, this thing started trying to imitate our dogs. We always let the dogs in at 7 p.m., and around 9 p.m. the barking would start. The barking in question, though, is very obvious, not natural. It is almost human-like and follows a strict pattern. Bark one second, bark, bark three seconds, and repeats for about 30 minutes before stopping. Once stopping, there will be taps and scratching on my window for a few minutes before everything stops completely and returns to normal. No one else in my house really cares as much as I do, and I know I'm probably overreacting. There is probably a decent explanation to this, but for now, I'm going to assume it's some sort of skinwalker or crawler. I'm an ecologist, used to work as an environmental monitor for some pretty remote mining operations here in Australia. Long back country driving, taking water samples upstream and downstream of the mine, that sort of thing. Most field days you're looking at about a 12-14 hour day, and you're unlikely to see another human being the entire time. During the shorter daylight months I'd often be starting and finishing work in the dark. About a month into the job, I noticed when driving down the roads through the scrub after sunset, there were all these little glimmering reflections on the road and in the grass. As if there were lots of little specks of broken glass reflecting back my vehicle spotlights. After seeing this every evening for a couple of months, I decided to find out what it was, got out of the truck, walked over to one and realized it was the reflecting eyes of a spider coming out begin their night's hunt. I must have passed millions of them before finding out what they were. One night, a few years ago, my aunt and I were driving down a familiar road we had traveled countless times before. It was a typical evening, nothing out of the ordinary, until something caught my attention. Out of the corner of my eye, I glimpsed a fleeting figure darting across the road and disappearing into the woods. I couldn't shake off the strangeness of what I had just witnessed. The creature I saw was unlike anything I had encountered before. It was smaller in size, hunched over, with a grayish complexion and sparse hair. The way it moved reminded me of a chimpanzee or some kind of primate. Instantly, I knew it wasn't a raccoon or any other familiar animal that I was accustomed to seeing in the area. Living on the East Coast, I was accustomed to the local wildlife and had seen my fair share of creatures in the region. However, this sighting was completely out of the ordinary. The image of that peculiar creature lingered in my mind, and I couldn't help but wonder what it could have been. I immediately shared my observation with my aunt, expressing my bewilderment at the sight we had just witnessed. She too was taken aback by the strangeness of the encounter. It was clear that this was no ordinary animal crossing our path that night. In the years that followed, I kept an eye out during my travels, hoping to catch another glimpse of that mysterious creature. However, it seemed that the sighting was a singular event, a fleeting encounter with an enigmatic being. Despite my curiosity, I never came across anything similar again. To this day, the memory of that night remains etched in my mind. I often find myself pondering the nature of the creature I saw and the mystery surrounding its existence. Was it a rare and elusive species that had managed to remain hidden from human eyes? Or perhaps it was a creature from folklore, 
venturing into our world for a brief moment. While I may never know the true identity of the creature I encountered that night, the experience has left me with a sense of wonder and an appreciation for the unknown. It serves as a reminder that there are still mysteries waiting to be unraveled, even in the familiar landscapes we think we know so well. So as I continue my journeys and explore the world around me, I keep my senses sharp, ready to embrace the unexpected and embrace the possibility of encountering something extraordinary. Who knows what other secrets the night may hold, just beyond the reach of our ordinary perceptions. I'm very late to this post, but I thought I'd share anyways. I am in the Navy, and at the time of this anecdote, I was part of a security detachment for a freighter off the coast of Iran. It was a few hours into my watch, probably around one on a gun mount, when a small fishing vessel near the horizon starts beaming our ship with a high-powered laser pointer. This is actually a pretty common occurrence in the area, but I reported to my superior to make sure they were aware. About two or three minutes later, I looked back over to where the vessel was to check on it, and it's gone. It was the middle of the night in the ocean, but my naked eyes should have picked up the boat with relative ease. I put on my night vision goggles and scanned the same area forward of the ship. Nothing. Literally nothing. No vessel, no stars, no horizon, just nothing. I felt like I was tired, perhaps my night watch was getting to my head. I took off the goggles and did some jumping jacks and push-ups for a few minutes and took another look. That's when I saw it, an impending wall of gray. No start, no beginning, just gray. Fog. Heavy, thick fog thicker than any fog I've ever seen. Within moments every metal surface was coated in mist. I could not see more than twenty or so feet in any direction. It was eerie, the civilians piloting the ship didn't use any horns or anything. We just sailed through the dense cloud. I couldn't even see the water. My only perception of speed was the thick mist moving past me. Luckily, nothing happened. But when you are standing in armed watch on a big freighter near Iran, in waters that have had reports of pirates, then your most important sense is taken away from you. I couldn't help but imagine what could happen as we moved through that dense fog for what seemed like 20 minutes. A friend of mine and I have been experiencing strange things as of late the past week or so. My first potential encounter with this thing happened seven years ago, but in the past week my friend and I have experienced some terrifying phenomena, climaxing at what he saw earlier today. The story is pretty long, so I'll hurry this up. It starts around seven years ago. I was camping with my family in northern Michigan. The campsite was near a large lake, so we went swimming often. I looked across the lake and saw a large white figure moving on the other side. It was around eight feet tall, had no fur, walked upright, and had no visible facial features. The moment I saw it, it ran into the woods. This was my first encounter. The story picks up around a week ago when my friend was in his house, home alone with his dog. It was around 11 p.m. He was in his bedroom when he heard his mother's voice speaking to his recently deceased dog. His other living dog appeared to hear the voice as well. His mother was at work, so it could not have been her, and the dog to whom the voice was referring had died around four weeks beforehand. After this comes my second experience. I was reading in my room when my mother's voice called for me to come to the living room. The sound was accompanied by what sounded like someone walking in my living room. The only people home at the time were me and my brothers who were asleep in their room, so I panicked and locked my door. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. The next day, my mother came into my room, asking me what I wanted. I was confused as I did not call her name. After I explained this, she appeared shocked, nearly certain that my voice had come from my bedroom. And finally, earlier today, my friend was walking his dog when he heard a rustling noise in a nearby sewer. Thinking that it was a raccoon, he walked over and looked into the drain. What was staring back up at him was a creature that he described as completely white, bald, thin, humanoid, and had no facial features, no eyes, anything. It looked around nine feet tall, 
but it was hard to tell due to its crouched position. After a few seconds, the creature dashed away into the sewer at an incredibly high speed. My friend then immediately called me and explained the situation, which led us to write this post. We would like to know if we are in any danger from this creature, and if so, how to protect ourselves from it, as well as what this creature may be. I'm from Texas and my family has land on the Guadalupe River. I've been tormented by something out there for about 35 years and only recently came to realize that it's probably a Sasquatch family. Now that I know what they are, I'm more annoyed than anything, but still don't feel safe there at night and especially outside. I saw a child and an adult in about 1989 when I was sleeping outside on a trampoline. The child about four and a half feet tall, its shoulders just barely breached the top of the trampoline frame woke me up by accident and I scared it, I guess, because I was so startled. I sat straight up from sleeping. I'm guessing it tried to touch me because that's just about the only thing that I can think of that would have caused me to jolt awake like that. It grunted. Then I saw something very tall and lanky run in the opposite direction to the trees. I then heard a loud humming noise that seemed to come from all directions and passed out. I have had multiple interactions over the years, mostly hearing them and seeing the red eyes and hearing them scream. I believe it lives under a bridge on X during the day where I and others have seen it on a dare to walk through the dark tunnel when we were kids. We heard something moving and it turned to look at us and we saw the red eyes. It was screaming, absolutely terrifying. It was about seven or eight feet tall. We didn't see a silhouette, only its eyes. At night, it roams up and down the property line back and forth to the river. Recently, we found odd things to mark trails like X's and branches stuck in fences, tricycles tied five feet high in a tree with vines, sheets tied around tree branches, and a dead animal in a tree next to a fort. The fort could be from kids or poachers because it's next to a park, but I don't know. The fort and the animal in the tree area are where the sound came from the first time I heard it. To this day, we are still hearing heavy, deep breathing in the tree line, hearing strange bird noises in the middle of the night all around the house. And a few years ago, I heard loud screaming on the river by the fort area. It sounded like a woman being hurt. I thought it was a mountain lion, so I just went inside. It was terrifying. My name is Ataraxia and I'm in high school. Last year, I went through a bad episode of depression. I'm doing much better currently and I was scrolling on TikTok and found a video of a girl who claimed she shifted into another reality in her sleep. At that point in my life, going to another reality even just for a few hours a day sounded great to me. Out of curiosity, I looked up tutorials and other info on YouTube and it soon became an obsession. For about eight whole months, I dedicated my free time to learning how to shift. The shifting I am talking about is not the kind where people say they went to an anime or Hogwarts or whatever. My desired reality, as they call it, was just a normal world where some of my problems did not exist. Since there are infinite realities that are similar to ours, I hope to reach one with those qualifications. On February 8, 2023, I decided to try shifting. I wrote down the date of when I went to sleep and the details of my desired reality. I tried my best to hold my vision of me waking up in that desired reality for as long as I could, but I fell asleep and had a dream of my previous day at school. I don't think the dream had to do with anything just adding it. I woke up disappointed and grabbed my phone to turn off my alarm, and I saw that my wallpaper was different. I thought it was weird, but I thought maybe I changed it accidentally somehow because the new wallpaper was an old one I had not too long again. Then things started to get strange as I got ready for school. Things were very slightly different. The pink pot on my desk no longer had the Kirby face I painted on it. My shoes were in a different cubby than I placed them and I go to a private school, so I place my school shoes in a top cubby so that they are easier to reach. I no longer had a paper cut on my thumb, 
My blazer was wrinkled and in the laundry, even though I washed it and ironed it on Monday, which would be Feb 6. My jewelry dish was gone, and instead my earrings were just on my nightstand. Those are just a few of the differences I can remember right now. I instantly thought about the shifting thing I tried last night, and assumed the worst which is I am in another reality. I continued on with my day, and I found out that no, my problems were not gone, so this was not my desired reality. School was different too. The road lines were much more worn out than usual on the way. Someone who I didn't know personally waved at me at school. I hit my hip really hard on a bench that I have never seen while turning my usual corner pretty fast to get to bio class. Our school banner in the courtyard was different. My assigned seat for religion class was different. My apps on my laptop were arranged differently. A character I had recently gotten in a gacha game was no longer on my account, and the currency count was different game was Honkai Impact 3rd, and the character missing was Hersher of Truth, and a bunch of other small changes that I don't distinctly remember. All I could think about all day was the fact that I was somewhere different and I was not home. I have never been one to be overly stressed and have panic attacks, but the stress was overwhelming and crushing. My head and eyes were hurting by the time I got home. When I got home, I went to bed and tried to shift back. I wrote on a piece of paper, home, over and over again, and put it under my pillow shifting method and set it in my head and imagined myself waking up at home again. I fell asleep and woke up. I started crying from relief when I saw my Kirby pot with a face again. The experience felt surreal to me almost like a really vivid dream, and I was very willing to peg it off as one. That's when I checked the date on my phone. It was Friday, February 10th. This meant I spent a day somewhere else. My friend that I didn't recall being with much yesterday as I spent my two breaks in the bathroom panicking at school, even asked me if I was all right, and that she was worried about me last night since I had been acting different and was very stressed out yesterday she knows that I am struggling with depression. I said it was nothing and that I was perfectly fine. Does this mean that I switched consciousnesses with another me? And if that was the case, did we both try to shift that same night or was it just me? Did I shift? Was this a dream? Was it something else? Either way, I took this as a sign to never try shifting ever again. I live in western North Carolina in a very secluded area. We have bears, we have seen coyote, deer even cougar on a tree cam, bobcats. What I am saying is I am familiar with the animals in the woods around me, and I know that what I saw was not an animal. One night about midnight or so our animals were acting very strange. The chickens were awake and squawking, the cats were up on the roof of the buildings or under them and growling. The dogs were whimpering and whining backing into the corners. So my son and I went to check just what was scaring them. He walked the property checking the pens and looking for anything. So we get to the back of the property where we have a utility path cut through to the mountain ridge. This path is about six foot wide and cuts along the top edge of a gully. Well about 30 foot from where we are standing is something. Darkish figure that is standing on two legs way taller than any man. It turned its head and looked at us in a way that made me feel threatened. The eyes shined blue in the flashlight beam. It looked at us and then turned and walked down into the deep gully. I have no idea what it was, but my son and I both saw it, and it was not an animal or a man. My name is... Well, you can call me Officer Brian. I work for a mid-sized police department in the outskirts of New York City. Myself and my partner have come across what we assume was a gagway while on patrol one night after being called to a persisting issue with teenagers at an old abandoned warehouse right near the woods. The incident happened about three years ago now, so some of the details are foggy, but I remember for the most part exactly how it went. My partner and I arrived at the old warehouse to be greeted by a decent-sized group of rowdy teenagers. They were apparently having some party in there, but it was pretty clear that they got freaked out when we showed up. Everybody fled. My partner insisted that we go inside to check it out, 
which I thought was dumb because there was no way I was going on that place. Once we became aware of the situation, we also left. Not a minute after we got onto the main road did my partner get called to another call about an incident near a small farm outside of town. Before arriving, he told me that there had been a number of missing persons cases in all the nearby area. They were all adults. When we first arrived at the farmhouse, it was clear something really wrong had gone on there. The wife of the man who lived there was crying in the arms of a paramedic and we were told by another officer there that she had discovered her husband's remains, his mangled corpse, in the barn when she opened it up to feed their pigs. I was disgusted and confused. I couldn't figure out how something so violent could happen with anybody. After getting escorted to the barn, I couldn't believe how wrong I was. The man who lived there was a pretty big guy in his mid-fifties, and the way he looked now made me wonder if he put up a fight at all. He was badly mangled. I won't get into the details other than his spine sticking out and his head twisted around. I had a difficult time getting a hold of myself while trying to talk to the wife of this man who was killed right there. After prying with some questions, she eventually revealed that her husband went to check out on some pigs earlier in the night, but never came back. I wondered if he was taken or eaten by his pigs since they were acting very strange. I knew deep down, though, that this wasn't done from a pig. This was from something else. I asked her what made her go out there, and she said it was because she heard snarling noises, and it sounded very out of place. Her husband had not come back either. She went on to say that she had heard these sounds before, but never paid much attention to them, that she had been hearing them a few days prior to this going on. I took her inside, convincing her I was sure everything would be fine. Meanwhile, my partner stayed behind with the other officers and assessed the scene while also having a look around the area for anybody or anything that could have had a connection or cause to this incident. One thing that really bothered me was that none of the other officers seemed to be concerned with the noises that I had heard. They didn't think it was connected to the man's death, but I knew better than anybody how violent and strange this was. I couldn't shake off what his wife had said about hearing those noises. This was the only thing I needed to keep looking into this. No one believed me. They said I was too new and didn't really know what I was doing. I'm still extremely disturbed by this whole incident. If you have any information on what happened or think you might know, I would love to hear your opinion. This is what I saw back in 1998-1999. It happened in Ohio, on a warm summer evening. I was sitting on my friend's deck, enjoying the peaceful night. Little did I know that I was about to witness something that would forever etch itself into my memory. It was a bit past midnight when it all unfolded. I remember gazing up at the sky, admiring the vast expanse of twinkling stars above. Suddenly, a blue streak tore across the heavens, resembling a meteor but much closer as if it were only 30-50 feet above me. It happened so quickly, leaving me in awe of the spectacle. But that was just the beginning. Only moments after the blue streak disappeared, I noticed something strange in the distance. Two figures emerged, standing taller than any human I had ever encountered. They seemed to materialize out of thin air, right before my eyes. My heart raced as I watched them, captivated by their presence. The figure in front turned its head, as if acknowledging my presence on the deck. It locked eyes with me for a brief moment, and I could feel a sense of curiosity emanating from it. Then, without warning, they both started to fade away, gradually becoming transparent as they walked away. The encounter lasted no more than twenty seconds, but it felt like an eternity. There was no possible explanation for what I had just witnessed. It couldn't have been a trick of the light or any ordinary phenomenon. These beings were undeniably real, walking upright and emitting a radiant white glow. As I sat there, stunned by what I had seen, I knew deep down that sharing this experience would be met with skepticism and disbelief. The sheer absurdity of the encounter made it difficult for me to discuss it with others. So I kept it to myself, burying the memory deep within me. Over the years, I occasionally pondered the events of that fateful night. 
the blue streak, the enigmatic beings, and the inexplicable glow they emanated. I questioned their origin, their purpose, and whether there were others out there who had witnessed similar phenomena. But no matter how much time passed, the memory remained vivid and haunting. It became my secret, my personal encounter with the unexplained. And though I may never fully comprehend what I saw that night, I am forever changed by the undeniable reality of the extraordinary beings who crossed my path. To this day, I carry the weight of that encounter, knowing that sometimes the most extraordinary experiences are the ones we keep hidden, locked away in the depths of our hearts. Honestly, I don't know how much I believe in cryptids, but my mother once told me a story. It involves my great-great-grandmother and her neighbor, essentially her boyfriend. Later in life, after her husband passed away, the story was shared with my mother by this neighbor when he was still young. According to the neighbor, he and his friends were playing a game of hide-and-seek one day. It was a typical day in the 1910s. As he found a hiding spot, nestled away from his seeking friends, something strange caught his eye. From the corner of his hiding spot, he saw a sight that would forever be etched into his memory. A long, white creature emerged from a sewer drain, moving on all fours with an uncanny grace. Its form was unlike anything he had ever seen before. It seemed to possess a certain alien quality. Curiosity overwhelmed him as he watched the creature intently. It crawled with an eerie precision, almost as if it knew it was being observed. Without warning, it disappeared into another nearby sewer drain, leaving the young boy in a state of both awe and confusion. As my mother relayed this story to me, I couldn't help but be intrigued. The image of this mysterious creature crawling through the sewers lingered in my mind. What do you all think? And before you start, mother would never lie to me. A camp instructor I once had was mountain biking or camping somewhere in Canada with a mate of hers. It was up in the mountains in a really remote place so she's biking around, and they decide to set up camp in a clearing up on the trail. They see the clearing is perfectly round and the trees surround it so they can't see out. They're chilling making noodles near the tent as the sun's setting, and they see around 10-15 people have surrounded them. The people are wearing dark robes and apparently something similar to HP Death Eater masks. The masked people start stepping in in unison and get closer and closer to them. They start freaking the F out and screaming at them to stop then get on their bikes and kick some of the people away and ride down the mountain as fast as they can. They come across a cabin and start banging on the door and a dude a hunter of some sort comes out. They explain the situation, and he radios his buddies to go check it out with him act. Turns out that place is a high-action cult area, and there has been missing persons and people taken by cults. Oh, and when the hunter got there, all the tent and stuff was taken. I had always known that being a Navy SEAL or part of Special Forces would mean facing the unimaginable but nothing could have prepared me for the chaos that unfolded in the heart of Mogadishu, Somalia. Our mission was clear. Rescue American hostages and thwart the resurgent warlord's plans. As part of the new generation of SEALs, I was ready to prove myself in the crucible of urban warfare. Our descent into the tumultuous streets of Mogadishu was swift and silent. We moved like shadows, our training ingrained in every step we took. The city was a labyrinth of danger, where every corner held the potential for ambush. We could feel the weight of history bearing down on us, for we knew that this city had once been the setting for the infamous Black Hawk Down mission. As we reached the hostage location, our intel proved accurate. We secured the Americans, their eyes filled with gratitude and relief. We were about to make our way back to the extraction point when the warlord's men descended upon us like a swarm of angry wasps. Urban combat was a nightmare. The narrow streets echoed with gunfire and the cacophony of battle. We fought relentlessly, trading fire with the enemy, each step forward costing us precious time and blood. In the midst of this chaos, our team was separated, 
and I found myself with only three other SEALs. We fought our way to the outskirts of town, battered and exhausted. The sun was setting, casting eerie shadows across the desolate landscape. That's when we saw it a creature unlike anything we had ever encountered. It was probably about eight feet tall, kind of dark gray with a little brown. It had a mane, kind of like a male lion, but with shorter hair around the body and legs. The most unsettling part was that it was walking upright on its back legs, like a twisted fusion of man and beast. As we cautiously approached our vehicle, the creature dropped to all fours and bolted away at an incredible speed. Confusion gripped our team as we exchanged bewildered glances. We couldn't have been prepared for what happened next. The creature attacked with a sudden ferocity, launching itself at us. Gunfire erupted as we opened fire, but the bullets seemed to do little more than anger the beast. Two of our men fell, torn apart by the creature's savage assault. Panic gripped us as we continued to fire, desperate to save our lives. It was a harrowing battle that felt like a nightmare, but eventually, our combined firepower took its toll. The creature fell lifeless to the ground, an enigma wrapped in death. With our fallen comrades in our hearts and the unsettling memory of the unknown predator etched into our minds, we made a hasty retreat from that desolate place. The extraction point was our lifeline, and we raced towards it with every ounce of strength we had left. We left Mogadishu behind, a city steeped in darkness and mystery, its streets haunted by the specter of warlords and the unknown. Back in the safety of our base, we debriefed, trying to make sense of what we had encountered. None of us had answers. It was as if we had stumbled upon a creature from the depths of myth and legend. As I look back on that fateful mission, I'm left with more questions than answers. What was the creature that had attacked us on the outskirts of Mogadishu? Where had it come from, and was it a harbinger of something even more ominous? In the world of Navy SEALs, we were trained to face the worst humanity had to offer, but the encounter with the unknown had left an indelible mark on us. We were meant to be the hunters, but in that moment, we had become the hunted, lost in a darkness that defied explanation. As I carry the memory of that mission with me, I am haunted by the knowledge that there are mysteries in this world that may never be unraveled, and that sometimes the shadows of the unknown are the most terrifying adversaries of all. I remember that day in Croatia like it was yesterday, although it's been years since that eerie reconnaissance mission on the deserted island. We were a Navy SEAL squad, sent on a classified operation to gather intel about maritime Navy activity in the region. Little did we know, we were about to stumble upon something that defied all logic and challenged our perception of reality. The island was rugged and desolate, overgrown with thick vegetation and surrounded by an ominous mist that seemed to hang in the air like a shroud. Our mission was simple. Infiltrate, gather intel, and exfiltrate without leaving a trace. Easy, or so we thought. As we trekked deeper into the heart of the island, we began to notice strange markings and symbols etched into the trees and rocks. They were unlike anything we had ever seen, and an unease began to settle over the team. We pressed on, our senses heightened, and our instincts on high alert. And then we saw it. The creature, if you could even call it that, emerged from the dense foliage. It was a hulking mass of hair and muscle, standing nearly eight feet tall. Its overlong arms hung nearly to its feet, each finger ending in an eight-inch claw that jutted out like deadly talons. It was covered in a sheen of silver-like hair, and its feet, human-like but monstrous in size, left enormous imprints in the earth. But what truly rattled us to our core was its head. It resembled more that of a grizzly bear with a shorter but deeply scarred snout. Those scars alluded to untold battles with beings even larger than itself, battles that it had somehow survived. Still though, emanating through that horrific exterior were those piercing blue eyes, eyes that seemed to project a sense of ancient experience, as if they had witnessed the rise and fall of civilizations. Before any of us could react, the creature lunged at us, its claws outstretched and its teeth bared in a guttural growl. Panic set in, and we opened fire with a barrage of bullets. 
The deafening roar of our weapons filled the air as we poured rounds into the monstrosity before us. The creature howled in pain but refused to fall. In a final desperate act, it turned and leaped with unnatural strength into the sea, disappearing beneath the surface without a trace. The water churned and frothed where it had been, but the creature was gone. We were left standing there, our weapons still trained on the water, our hearts pounding in our chests. The mission had been a success. We had retrieved the classified documents we came for. But as we made our way back to the extraction point, the weight of what we had witnessed began to sink in. Back on the extraction chopper, none of us spoke a word. The image of that creature, with its impossible anatomy and ancient eyes, was seared into our minds. We had faced countless dangers in our line of work, but this was something entirely different, something beyond our comprehension. As we returned to base, we couldn't help but wonder what we had stumbled upon that day. What was that creature, and where had it come from? We may never have answers to those questions, but one thing was for certain. The line between reality and the unknown had blurred that day on the deserted island in Croatia, and it left us all questioning the boundaries of what we thought we knew. I swear to you, what I'm about to share is a true story. I work at NASA, and for obvious reasons, I need to remain anonymous. Let's just call me Randy, after the legendary guitarist Randy Rhodes. I have always been drawn to the mysteries of the universe, and little did I know that one fateful day, my life would take a mind-boggling turn. It was during a routine space mission, monitoring the vastness of space from the control room, when something extraordinary happened. As I gazed at the screens displaying data from distant planets, my eyes widened in disbelief. There, amidst the black void, appeared an object that defied explanation. At first, I thought it was a computer glitch, but curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't resist investigating further. As I zoomed in on the object using the cameras, my heart skipped a beat. It was no trick of the light or fabrication. Right before my eyes, the object revealed itself to be a highly advanced extraterrestrial spacecraft. Words fail me as I attempt to describe its appearance. The craft had a sleek, metallic exterior, with a silvery sheen that seemed to shimmer in the distant starlight. Its shape was unlike anything I had ever seen, a combination of smooth curves and sharp angles that defied conventional aerodynamics. Mysterious symbols adorned its surface, symbols that were alien to any known language. Fighting the urge to panic, I knew I had to document this unprecedented encounter. I grabbed my camera and snapped as many photographs of the UFO as I could, Every detail was essential. I watched in awe as the craft maneuvered effortlessly through the cosmos, defying our understanding of propulsion systems. There were no visible rockets, no conventional means of propulsion. It simply glided through space, defying the laws of physics. Just as I thought the encounter couldn't get any more bewildering, the unimaginable happened. In an instant, the craft vanished before my eyes, as if it had never been there. I was left dumbfounded, my mind racing to comprehend the enormity of what I had witnessed. Filled with a mix of awe, disbelief, and a hint of fear, I immediately contacted my supervisor. Trembling, I recounted the entire encounter, from the initial sighting to the abrupt disappearance of the UFO. The gravity of the situation was palpable as my supervisor arrived, his expression a mixture of concern and secrecy. As he examined the photographs I had taken, he urged me to keep this encounter strictly confidential. He emphasized the potential impact on the public, the fear and chaos it could incite. I was instructed not to share my experience with anyone, not even my closest colleagues. My discovery was to remain hidden from the world. Still reeling from the surreal events of the day, I returned home, my mind swirling with questions and uncertainties. I couldn't shake the feeling that the truth needed to be revealed that humanity deserved to know. Fueled by a sense of responsibility, I decided to take matters into my own hands. And that's why I'm here, sharing my account with you. Anonymity provides a shield of protection, allowing me to reveal the truth without risking my career or the stability of society. 
This story must be told, and it's up to those who hear it to decide what to make of it. Remember, this is not fiction. This is my first-hand experience, and it has forever changed my perception of the cosmos. This is one of the craziest yet creepiest experiences I had. So, I've been a pretty avid hiker and backpacker all my life. I live in North Carolina and often drive west toward the mountains to find places to explore. But on this particular adventure, I just picked a random forest far enough from any major cities and towns that I could see the stars well enough without light pollution. It was a fairly uneventful day and I was setting up camp near a small creek for the night had my fire going, and was about to eat when I heard something coming toward me directly in front of me. I pulled out my 9mm, I always bring just in case, and waited. An older man walks into the firelight. He has a smile on his face and was wearing an old farmer's hat, red button-up shirt and jeans. He put his hands up saying he meant no harm and was just wondering who was out in the middle of nowhere. I was hesitant keeping my gun at the ready but relaxed a little. Me and the old guy start to have a pretty interesting conversation as he sits across from me. Eventually, he told me his name was Louise, but asked me to call him Lou. So me and Lou talk well into the night, sharing stories and laughing a lot of it was about his life and family who he said he doesn't see anymore seeing. He lived out in the middle of nowhere. It was honestly one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had with another human being in my life. Maybe around 3 a.m. I tell him I'm going to go to sleep and he agrees, but before I went in my tent he stopped me, having come up to me with his hand on my shoulder, and let me tell you his touch was cold as ice. What he said I've never forgotten, he said. Thank you for this, it's so nice to be able to talk to someone after so long. I kind of smiled despite my skin crawling under his touch, and told him he seemed like a good man, and he should go see his family that I'm sure they missed him as much as he did. He sort of sniffled and nodded and asked if it was all right if he slept out by the fire, and I agreed stupid, I know. So I go to bed, and the next morning Lou was gone. I don't think much of it and pack my stuff and head in the direction he came from the night before. About 100 yards or so from where I was camped, I found a decrepit cabin. My gut told me to go check it out so I slip inside. And that's when I see something that changed my outlook on life and death. Sitting in an old rocking chair with some skeletal remains. Bits of cloth that were cloths still sticking to it. It took a minute, but then I noticed the almost perfect old farmer's hat perched on the chair, and the pieces of red cloth sticking to the remains. I sort of just walked out after that. I was numb, in shock, I guess. Next thing I knew, I was unlocking the door to my car and driving home. I don't know what I saw that night, but I can say I do believe in ghosts now though part of me wants to believe I helped him somehow. I've been back to that forest, but I could never find that cabin again. Honestly, I just hope wherever Lou is he is happy and with his family. I know this ended kind of sappy, but I figured it pretty creepy enough to qualify. When I was around 17-18, some friends invited me to a hunting, fishing, or camping kind of thing. I rarely went so far north in my country, so I agreed despite not having anything to do with this kind of stuff. I feel like I have to say I'm from Moldova, Eastern Europe. Those woods connect with Romania and Ukraine, at least they did back in the day, I'm 28 now. A huge forest, even experienced hunters get lost sometimes. I also have to add that our hunters don't have trails made specifically for them. No trail, no camps made for tourists or hunters, not nothing. It's pure mother nature and you. We do have tourist spots, but they never go really far. We must have walked two, three hours before we even found the spot. We camped there and after a while we went deeper. After four hours we picked up signs that there is a boar somewhere. We went after it and even split when someone saw fox signs around. I went with three others after the fox. We went towards and I even saw from afar, but something scared it and it went in a different location very fast. We also noticed some movement. The location is higher than us and for some reason we decided to go there. 
At first, we thought it's other hunters, but soon enough we understood it's something else. We found the spot, but no one was there, blood all over the place. I never thought things like that happen in real life. Five meters around splashes of blood. Some stains even led further from the spot. I was enchanted by it and wanted to go after it, but then my friend stopped me. The most experienced one said to go back slowly, and he even took his gun in his hand. He usually kept it at his thigh. Not the hunting rifle. I got scared very fast because obviously it was not right. But that was nothing because then I saw a human hand ripped in pieces, mauled by big teeth. I noticed how my friend would look around and knowing him I knew someone is watching. We went back very fast and the guys circled me for protection. I think the fact that my badass friends were so protective of me raised the biggest red flags for me because they're usually not this way. We tried to call the others but no signal and one of my friends made a fire with smoke. One hour passed and nothing. I knew they had to fire a couple of times in the air to signal them, but somehow they were afraid to do it because according to my friend, someone else could know where we are. Another friend replied, too late for that, they are close. At this point, I started to laugh because I thought they are pranking me until I heard something in the direction where we came from. They never explained anything to me, but from what I understood when they talked to each other, there was this vicious and smart pack of wolves that come from the mountains, either Romania or Ukraine. Deforestation is a real problem in those countries especially Romania, so many wild animals that disappeared in our country started to appear recently. They encountered this pack a while ago, but thought they went back or scared them off, but apparently they came back to the place where my friends usually gathered. The thing is, they're not afraid of firearms like common wolves in my country are. So basically, we couldn't reach our friends and according to the friends I was with, the pack went after them after tracking us. This is still illogical to me, but it was logically for them, so who am I to question them? This pack also attacks people, hungry or not, and even hunt people much more often than other animals. Last time they met the pack, they went after them for 50 kilometer until they reached their destination near water. They used their firearms on them, but nothing helped. Two of my friends decided to go after the others and warn them about the pack. Me and the friend that stayed, left almost everything in the camp and basically went back home. My two friends also took a bare minimum and ran. It was midnight and still, no sign of my friends, not even a signal. The friend that was with me couldn't handle the pressure, and equipped himself with grenades and army clothes and went to the camp in case if any of them came back. Later that night I saw his signaling fire at the camp. I tried to stay occupied and started to clean up when I hear howling very close. I looked at the window that faces the forest and nothing. Then after the second howling, I realized they're near the house. Somehow they managed to jump the fence and they actually circled the house. They were walking in the circle. Someone called and I have to say, I was never so scared and happy in my entire life. Scared because I jumped when it rang. One of my friends were practically screaming in the phone to go in the basement and release the puppy. To say that I'm shocked is to say nothing. I couldn't understand a lot of things he said, because the signal was bad, also because he was screaming. They knew the pack is at the house and they were coming, but for some reason, I had to go in the basement to get some puppy. Honestly, I think, subconsciously, I knew what was going on, but at the time I was too scared to think. I found a baby wolf in the basement. My genius friends thought it's a good idea to bring in their house, the baby of the wolf pack that killed people. I was never more angry at them than that time, and they have done stupid things before. The problem was that if I opened the door at the basement to release the puppy, the wolves could get me. So I decided to take it to the second floor and put in a basket or something and gently put it on the ground with a rope. I found everything I needed when I heard scratches on the door. The wolf mama wanted to get in and honestly, if she knew how old the house is, she would just probably put her weight on the door and then she would easily come inside. I went to the balcony and slowly started to get the basket down. The wolves were there, looking at me and all my moves. 
The she-wolf was easy to spot. She ran towards the puppy. I have to stay the reunion was touching, but the wolves were only happy for five seconds. One of them even tried to jump at me. I was hypnotized. I watched them take the puppy and going where they came from. The she-wolf took the puppy in the teeth and jumped the fence. The rest of them jumped too, except one. He must have been the oldest, he had very smart eyes. He looked at me for a long time before he jumped too. I was scared and fascinated and a couple of times when he went into the forest, he would look back and honestly, it was the greatest thing ever. My friends came back a couple of hours after that, worried about me, but I told everything, and they were also shocked to hear about the behavior of these wolves, except one, the brother of the thief who took the puppy. He punched him right in the jaw and broke it. They didn't speak a couple of years after that. In the forest, they barely survived the pack. The only thing that saved them was the smelly bomb the brother had, not before he was bitten a couple of times. Other friends were attacked too until the two friends that were with me came to their rescue with fire. I know the story is incredible and many will say it's fake, but God it, it's the best story of my life, and I don't care if people believe me. No one can take that from me. Also, I think since I don't know the whole story in many details, the story seems unreal. But I bet if one of my friends would tell it would seem more real. Back when I was a high school senior, my buddy and I had a burning desire to ride our dirt bikes in solitude, far away from any disturbances. We ventured up an isolated logging road, deep into an area of second growth dug fir. After setting up camp in a clearing, our plan was to spend a couple of days immersed in this rugged wilderness. During the day, we tore up and down the local trails on our dirt bikes, relishing in the adrenaline-fueled joy of the ride. As dusk approached, signaling the end of our thrilling escapades, we made our way back to camp. However, our path was unexpectedly obstructed by a massive log deliberately placed across the trail. We knew for certain that this log hadn't been there earlier in the afternoon when we had zoomed past multiple times. Its deliberate positioning gave us an unsettling feeling. Considering the log size, we didn't dare attempt to move it from the trail. Instead, we managed, with great effort, to maneuver our dirt bikes around the barrier. Unease and vulnerability crept into our consciousness, casting doubt on whether we should stay the night at the campsite. But fueled by Budweiser and bolstered by the fact that one of us had brought along his dad's 357 caliber, we made the decision to tough it out. Sleep evaded us throughout the night, so we built a substantial fire to ward off the darkness and its lurking uncertainties. However, around midnight, our feeble sense of security shattered. A massive rock came hurtling into our camp, followed by the cacophony of something colossal crashing through the undergrowth. The air was rent with otherworldly screams and growls, further unsettling our already frayed nerves. Another rock descended upon us, jolting us into immediate action. With hearts pounding, we sprinted towards our pickup truck and tore down the logging road, heading for the safety of Alsi. In our haste, we left behind much of our camping gear, but we had the presence of mind to load our dirt bikes onto the truck earlier. The next day, in broad daylight, we returned to retrieve our abandoned belongings. Fear still lingered, preventing us from thoroughly investigating tracks or seeking other evidence. We hastily gathered what we could and made a swift departure from that eerie place. I live in Australia and I used to date this girl who lived in one of our national parks, a solid two-hour drive from anything. Anyway, one night it gets to like 2 a.m. and I've got to go home for some reason I can't remember. I'm driving along this pitch black road, no street lights, thick bush either side of the narrow road, a mess. I'm in a Land Rover Defender for the uninformed, a fairly boxy car with a flat back and a flat front, no curves. Anyway, I'm wigging myself out. It's a long drive and I'm prone to thinking of scary things. After about 30 minutes of driving, I look in my rearview mirror and see a silhouette of a person sitting in the back seat of the car. I am frozen with fear, literally can't take my eyes off them, can't stop driving, can't move.
About 30 seconds later and nothing happens, I move my arm up to move the mirror a little to see if I'm seeing things, and as I raise my arm, the person in the back waves at me. I freak out, what the F? A car appears from in front of me driving the other way and I'm thinking, yes, I'll flag this guy down and get rid of the offender or some shit. But when I look in the mirror again, the person is gone. The car flies past me. I look back and the person is back again. I turn my head slowly, watching the mirror in my periphery and the person slowly turns its head too. Got him that I'm scared. Finally, I slowly grab my jumper in the front seat to throw at the intruder, and in one big motion I huck it backwards at the person so I could reef on the brakes and get out. Terrible plan, but I'm scared as. Anyway, I realize that the mother F in the back is my reflection off the back window of the car. The boxy shape meant my reflection looked perfectly like someone sitting in the back seat. Might be too late to respond, but one of my friends lives in an apartment complex next to a main road and some stores behind a gas station. It's an old complex and not in the middle of the woods or anything, but there are some back alleys and some trees nearby. Anyway, one night we were up playing Hearthstone or something and we started hearing this really, really freaky noise. My friend keeps his windows open on the second floor to help with cooling the apartment. We both just kind of sit there stunned, before I finally ask in a very low voice, what the F is that? It was like a cry, but like no animal ID ever heard. Imagine like the freakiest zombie cry in a movie, and it sounded just like that, but loud and right outside. It persisted for about 20 minutes, and we just kind of stopped making noise, and didn't do anything that would draw attention to us. Still have no idea what the hell it was. Mentioned it to my friend again just recently. The moon hung low in the night sky as I stood outside the apartment building, my heart pounding with a mix of excitement and nervous anticipation. Today was the day I would join the ranks of the police force as a rookie officer. My name is Alex, and I had always dreamed of making a difference, of upholding justice in a world that seemed too often plagued by darkness. My partner for this first assignment was Detective Ryan, a seasoned veteran with a reputation for his sharp instincts and unwavering resolve. Together, we were tasked with investigating a homicide case, a daunting task for a rookie like me, but I was eager to prove myself. As we approached the apartment, a sense of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. The door was locked, a barrier between us and the truth hidden within. With a swift kick, Detective Ryan forced the door open, revealing a chilling scene that would forever be etched in my memory. There before us lay the lifeless body of the victim. It was a gruesome sight, a chilling reminder of the evil that lurked in the shadows. But what shocked us both was not just the presence of death, but the grotesque creature feasting on the remains. It was a dog-like creature, but larger, more akin to a wolf. Its hulking figure loomed over the body, its snarling face contorted with an unsettling mix of animalistic hunger and a twisted, human-like visage. The sight sent shivers down my spine, and I felt an instinctive urge to protect and serve, to rid the world of this abomination. Reacting on pure instinct, Detective Ryan and I drew our weapons and fired at the creature, hoping to neutralize the threat it posed. But the bullet seemed to have little effect. It let out a chilling growl, launching itself at us with a speed and strength that defied logic. Caught off guard, we were tackled to the ground, our bodies hitting the floor with a resounding thud. The creature slipped away from our grasp, a blur of fur and teeth, disappearing into the night before we could regain our footing. The chaos and confusion that ensued left us breathless, questioning the reality of what we had just witnessed. We exchanged bewildered glances, our faces etched with disbelief and uncertainty. Did we really see what we think we saw, or was it some hallucination brought on by exhaustion or something we inadvertently ingested? The questions lingered in the air, a heavy fog obscuring the truth. With a deep breath, Detective Ryan and I collected ourselves, determined to make sense of the inexplicable. 
We scoured the surroundings, searching for any trace of the creature, but it was as if it had vanished into thin air. Frustration mingled with disbelief, our minds struggling to comprehend the events that had unfolded. As we stood there, gazing into each other's eyes, a silent understanding passed between us. We may never fully understand what we witnessed that night, but we knew that our duty remained to protect the innocent, to uphold justice, and to face the darkness head-on, even when it defied explanation. In the end, we may never have a definitive answer to the question that haunted us. Did we truly encounter a monstrous being, or was it an illusion, a trick of the mind? My friend and I, both 18-year-old males at the time, decided to go camping in the Mogollon Rim of northern Arizona. We had no particular spot in mind as to where to camp, so we drove around the NF woods until we came across a small, very secluded lake. I literally brought everything a guy would need to be out camping in the wilderness. Sleeping bags, lighter, food, knife, etc. Except I had forgotten my brand new Coleman tent I purchased specifically for this adventure. So we wound up just camping in our sleeping bags on the ground next to the fire. It took forever to fall asleep because the temperatures dropped below freezing and we were shaking. We went based off the weather for Payson, Arizona, which was 4,000 feet and 50 miles from where we actually laid camp. My friend will call him Tom fell asleep before I did. I can't remember if ever did fall asleep or if I was just half asleep. But around midnight, I start hearing some really weird noises in the distance. I knew there elk buggling nearby, so I didn't think much of it. Gradually, a snapping sound kept getting closer and closer to the camp over the course of about a half hour. I started getting scared, hoping it would go away, but it didn't. Suddenly, on the side of camp closest to Tom, I hear something running through the meadow straight toward us. I jumped up so fast and yelled at Tom to get up. While I was yelling at him, I was searching the ground nearby for my .40 caliber handgun. By the time I got the gun and flashlight trained on Tom, there is was massive black bear standing right above him. Tom was trying to get up having realized there was in fact a bear hovering above him. I aimed in the direction of the bear and squeezed the trigger four times. I could hear the bear run off not knowing whether I hit it or not. We were shaking so fiercely afterwards I couldn't tell if it was the cold or the adrenaline. We then packed our sleeping bags and left all of the other stuff to retrieve in the morning and began the half mile walk back to the dirt road where Tom's car was. I could be wrong but I'm pretty sure that Bear stalked us all the way back to the car. When I was a kid, I went for cross-country biking nearby to our home. There is a roughly two kilometers, one, five miles loop of a forest path in the forest. It is ride-able if a bit difficult at some points. After just riding a couple of minutes on a narrow forest path, I see a figure walking ahead of me. It looks like a hooded elderly lady walking really slowly. I cannot see her face or anything, just a dark hood covering her. I recall she being very tall, but I was also just 13 years old, so she could have been normal size. I drove just behind her, but the path is too narrow to overtake her from any of her sides. Also, I get this heavy feeling on my chest telling me not to try to overtake her. I can't explain it, but something just felt very off when I got closer to her. I stop my bike and get off and watch her walk ahead of me. I then think that this is silly, and she must be startled if she turns around and sees me there. So I think to act cool and turn down to pick up a blueberry. I pick it up, raise my head back to the road ahead of me, and there is nothing. I can see the path ahead maybe 50 meters, and it's just impossible that she would have never done that distance within those five seconds I wasn't watching. I then try to reason this with and think that she must have jumped off road, since there is extremely thick bushes and I cannot see there. I felt a bit uneasy about this, but decide to continue. I ride my bike about 500 meters more, and there is a cliff where I can see down the road ahead another 500 meters. And there she is, I can see her walking there again really slowly. Again, tall figure covered in a dark hood. I cannot see her face or anything but the hood she is wearing. 
and she is walking slowly on the road. I really couldn't figure out how she made it there in such a short time, since even I couldn't do the distance in that time even with my bike. I am extremely alarmed at this point but decide to continue. I drive the hill down and to the spot where I saw her before. Again there is nothing. At this part of the forest it is more open and I can see quite far in any direction. Yet she is nowhere to be seen and yet there she was just 30 seconds before. I continue my trip and finally finish my first loop of the trail and decide to go yet another round. After going for a couple of minutes there she is, exactly the same spot I saw her at the first time, again tall dark hooded, walking slowly. I got totally freaked out after this, I rode off the woods as fast as I could and in a total panic ride to my friend's home which was further away from the woods than my own home. Until today I have no idea what I saw and it gives me the chills when I remember her figure. When I was a little kid, my mom was out of town and I was with my dad at our house. Our house was on a remote Indian reserve in Canada, and about three miles away was my grandparents' house. Our houses were separated by three large wheat fields surrounded by forest. I don't know why, but my dad got me ready at night time, and we started walking on the gravel road to my grandparents' house. My mom had the vehicle with her. I was under the age of five and pretty small girl. I remember it was a clear autumn night, the wheat fields were a few weeks from being harvested, and there was a bright full moon. There wasn't a single vehicle running in miles. We started hearing something following us. It was in the ditch in the tall grass and in the wheat field. My dad held my hand as he grabbed some stones off the gravel road. He started hurling rocks into the ditch. It would run off and then start following us again. He grabbed more stones and put them in his pocket, then put me on his shoulders. I remember holding on to his forehead when I was sitting on his shoulders, and it was all sweaty. I wasn't scared. I was getting excited every time I spotted that thing. I could see a lot better from way up, and I could see the thing's back or shoulders moving through the grass. I'd point it out to my dad, and then he'd throw more stones at it. It kept on coming back. To make matters creepier, we took a shortcut that was along the forest line on a thin dirt road. My dad started whistling loudly for my grandparents' German shepherd, Boss. The house was still far away, but we could hear Boss barking and moving towards us. Whatever that was following us was still following us. That dog was such a welcoming sight to see, sniffed around both of us for a moment, then dashed off into the field barking like mad. We got to my grandparents' house, my dad told my grandparents. I fell asleep on the couch. I talked to my dad about it many years later. He said after that they had smudged. My grandparents and father believe in the old ways and think maybe it was some bad medicine spirit and prayed for protection. Whatever it was, I was the target. Predators always go for the youngest or oldest. First of all, let me clarify that this is happening at my brother's house, not mine. The house has been around a little over a hundred years. My grandparents lived there for at least 50 years. My brother and his wife bought the house when they sold it. Every time I was over there as a kid, I felt like I was being watched. The upstairs was the worst. Especially the room next to the stairs, you just feel like you're not alone. Here's what they've told me. Pretty much every single night they hear footsteps all throughout the house. If they ask whatever it is to stop, it stops immediately. One day my sister-in-law, his wife, was home alone and heard my brother's voice coming from the baby monitor on the first floor. The other two monitors were on the second floor in my niece and nephew's bedrooms. It sounded exactly like him, but she called and made sure he was at work, not at the house. One night my nephew woke up around 3 a.m. to see what he described as a dark shape of a little boy looking into his bedroom. He said the boy started running down the hall to the room by the stairs, but when my nephew went in there he was gone. He drew a picture of this little boy but my nephew was six when it happened, he's eight now, so it was just a stick figure. 
The land itself used to be part of a property of a very old house up the road. I'm pretty sure they owned slaves back in the day. My first thought was maybe it's the ghost of a slave who was buried on the property, but that doesn't explain the voices right. Can ghosts mimic the living, or is this something else? What do you guys think? So two of my friends snuck out last summer and took a walk listening to music. Decided to sit down on the road and talked a bit, and they both heard a distant scream that sounded pretty similar to an elk screech, but for like one second in duration. So they turned off the music and saw a huge humanoid horse looking things sprint out of this forest into a field. And they said it was running really fast, like 40 miles per hour. They said it was kind of hunched and had a limp was lean but muscular, and was completely pale or gray and naked. They both sprinted home and FaceTimed each other. When they got home and told me and a few others about it the next day, I was in disbelief so I snuck out on my bike the next night with my other friend and met up with the two original people along with some others and went looking for it. We heard the noises they described and me and my one friend saw a pale Bigfoot looking creature walk in front of someone's barn light like 300 yards away, but we're not sure. We continued to do this for a few nights and one of them was walking to meet up with us alone to go looking for it, and had seen it like five times on the walk there, sometimes like 20 feet in front of him. We probably all went looking for it like six or seven times in total. The last time we went looking we all saw it, and it was super tall like eight, 10 feet super fast and had these glowing eyes you could see from a mile away. I'm pretty sure I also saw it have these long greasy locks or strands of hair about shoulder length. Looked like a mix between a crawler, Iran Jaeger Titan form, and Jeff the Killer. It was creepy. And when it was on pavement, you could hear clopping noises like it had hooves or something. Aside from this, I was on a late night gas station walk later that summer with two of my friends at three in the morning. And on our way back, we saw something run or hobble across the road about 70 yards in front of us, and it looked pretty similar. However, it was much smaller, maybe five feet tall, but I could see it being maybe seven feet if it was standing fully upright. Does anybody have an idea of what this massive thing could be? This was in rural Northeast Ohio. Edit. Was reading this over and forgot to add. We were walking on the way back to my friend's house one of the nights and behind somebody's house, we heard the noise of a baby crying in the woods. Couldn't have been mistaken for anything else but a baby. I did my undergrad at this tiny little college in the middle of a mountain range. Literally miles and miles of woods on every side. I think about 100 acres was technically the school's property but except for the weird high security facility a few miles to the east, none of the neighbors cared if kids went hiking onto their property as long as they weren't destructive and wore bright colors during hunting season. Had a kid the year above me get a calf full of birdshot after running into their property with a turkey call. Anyways, the point is, there is or was a lot of woods and a lot of trail markers. My now ex, still very violent or nutty fiancé was in a grad program in the city, so we were living apart. I was planning on going on a quick two-mile walk through the woods on a well-marked trail, just to see the lake, distress from midterms, etc. Relationship was extremely rocky at this point, and I get a phone call right before I start the trail. What it was about doesn't matter. The important part was that it was essentially a napalm bomb to the heart and my trust in humanity. Not trying to be dramatic, I was just a sensitive kid. So I took off sprinting down the trailhead, tears running down my face. Figured I'd take a slightly different trail that goes up a steep incline and maybe just burn myself out. It works, kind of. I'm catching my breath and still sobbing, and I hear a group of people on the trail headed towards me. Not wanting to be known as the crying girl in the woods and not entirely in my right mind, I took off running in a random direction, passing a lot of the tree houses and forts that people make in the woods, telling myself I know where I am and that I hike these woods often and can find my way back to either the trail entrance or to the road. 
I jumped two creeks, which in hindsight should have stopped me, because that meant I was straying way off campus. But I kept going, slipping on branches, and then picking a new direction to run in. I was a dumb kid. I was a really dumb kid. There were a couple turkey vultures following me which wasn't too surprising. Kids left food out pretty often so they tended to be watchful. On long hikes by myself I'd often sing to them when they tagged along. I started getting tired and slowed down to a walk, heading towards a small clearing with some toppled birch trees to sit on. My face was all messed up and my hair had little sticks and leaves in it, but I wasn't crying anymore. I lit a cigarette and stared at the ground and felt pretty damn sorry for myself. At some point I stopped feeling pretty damn sorry for myself and started feeling jumpy, kind of tingly, and everything I saw had this new level of sharpness and clarity to it. It wasn't really a feeling that I was being watched, more like I was somewhere I really, really didn't belong. It was starting to get dark, I had no cell service. The only thing I had on me besides my phone was a lighter, pack of cigarettes, and small pocket knife. Shorts, t-shirt, light windbreaker. I was literally search and rescue's worst nightmare. Trying to calm myself down, I tried to find any trail markers. None. Didn't recognize anything around me, couldn't hear any running water, and was too turned around to know where the road was. It was getting pretty chilly and the woods were starting to make that sound that I can only describe as teeming. I didn't want to wander in a random direction, but the feeling of dread kept getting stronger and stronger so I slowing started walking. Started hearing things, mostly whispers, which I figured I was hallucinating due to dehydration or exhaustion. And then the shadows. It was the strangest thing, these tall thin shadows being cast on the trees, I would have chalked it up to the sunset but the movement of them was unnatural, and I kept catching them in the corner of my eye. They kind of swayed, or kind of jumped. It was a strange juxtaposition between how thoroughly creeped out I was and how pretty the sunset was that night. I remember looking at the sky, trying to calm myself down and pick a direction that felt right. But no direction felt right. I kept getting turned around, heard a few distinctive twig snaps in the distance. A wicked chill ran down my spine, and at this point I wasn't thinking Eldritch Forest Elves, I was thinking Bobcat or Black Bear. Started sniffling and crying silently again because I knew I had messed up. I was fifty shades of paranoid, dehydrated, and I prayed to God hallucinating. And then I heard a rustle of wings that just about scared the shit out of me, and I looked up, and there was the vulture. Just looking at me. I was so out of it that I think I asked it for help. It stared at me for a few more seconds and then took off. It landed on a branch a few meters away and stared at me, doing the angry feather fluff thing that they do. Walked up to the tree it was perched in, and it took off again and landed on another branch a ways away. So I did what any sane person would do in that situation and followed the vulture. The feeling of dread slowly wore away and I started feeling okay. It was such a polite vulture, waiting for me to catch up and then flying off again. I don't remember how long I followed it, just that it was a while, and even when it was getting really twilight dusky out I still felt safe. I started recognizing landmarks glacial boulders, the tree forts, and could hear voices up ahead. The vulture lead me a few more meters, right onto the main trail, and then stayed put. I thanked it, apologized, and made my way towards the group of people camped out. I knew a bunch of the kids, they freaked out. I was promptly handed hot tea and french fries. They asked how the hell I made my way out there and I just shrugged. I didn't feel like sharing about the vulture, and when I tried to spot him again he'd flown off. Here's the real scary part of the story though. No one realized I was gone. I lived alone, and my friends had assumed that I wasn't answering texts because I was studying. It was also a Friday, meaning that no one would have even thought it strange I was gone, as I often left to the city without telling anyone for the weekend. Essentially, no one would have even started looking until Monday, at which point I might have been either bobcat food or a sacrifice to the dear god. So thank you my kind, kind vulture friend. Vultures are hands down my favorite animals now.
I recently received a telephone call from a friend of an eyewitness who was born and raised in a northwest suburb of Chicago, Illinois. The only specific location reference was given as near the Des Plaines River. The eyewitness D discussed multiple sightings from 1978 through 1988 while he lived there as a boy. The sightings would usually occur at dusk and would continue throughout the night and there were at least two winged creatures always seen flying in a wide circle at an altitude of 500-600 feet. The creatures were silhouetted against the clouds that were backlit by the city lights. The description of these creatures was that there was no head or neck that could be seen. They had long, thick tails, but no legs or feet were visible. The huge wings had no feathers, but were membraned, similar to that of a dragon or pterosaur. Apparently, the neighborhood residents were well aware of the nightly sightings. I solo sail a lot. I learned to sail when I was little and have done three transatlantic cruises so far. This one time I was doing a transatlantic crossing from the Canaries to St. Lucia. It was late and I was on deck doing an equipment check as per routine when sailing alone. So I am six days into the 14-day journey, and it's just nothingness all around. I mean absolutely no light save for the stars and the moon. I can literally remember this like it was yesterday because I have never seen anything like it before. I was on deck and all of a sudden it was bright. Like midday full sun bright. Mind you, it was near 2 a.m. at this point, so it made literally no sense. Immediately I assumed it had to be a flare, someone needed help. I came to a full stop, lowered the sails and began radioing on all the emergency channels in Spanish and English. I did this for almost two hours, circling around and checking the radio, there was nothing. Around the second hour I gave up, I marked the location of my search pattern and kept going. I had no idea what it was, never saw anything like it again. The whole night lit up like the sun was out for a good three, four seconds. Unbelievable. Last year my brother was driving through the dark roads of South Shore, Massachusetts near the Bridgewater Triangle. It was dark and there's limited street lights in the area. As he was driving he noticed a cloaked figure standing on the tree line at the side of the road. He described it as wearing white robes and looking almost like a clansman, but without the pointy hat. As he drove by the figure took notice and pivoted towards him very quickly, making direct eye contact. He became frightened enough that he sped away. I often wonder what he might have seen that night. Most of the town is very dense forest and the roads are unwalkable with no shoulders, so whatever it was likely came out of the woods. It unsettles me knowing the amount of acreage it came out of and whatever this person if it was a person was doing on the side of the road watching cars. In July 2018, I was staying in a very isolated region with limited access behind three log gates 20 miles south of Whitethorn, California on a primitive 4x4 road. This place is at the end of the road, a lost world of primeval forest on the northern border of a vast green belt spreading from Shelter Cove on the Lost Coast east to Highway 101 and south to Fort Bragg, California. At about 3 a.m. I was awakened. It was a hot, dark, and completely silent July night in these mountains. Something above my tent location, approximately two to three hundred meters, began knocking on wood. It's best described as loud wax by a big club or branch on a tree trunk. They started one knock, which got my attention. There was a brief hesitation, then several more knocks, but randomly timed. The knocking was loud, so loud that it echoed down the canyon in the stillness. The event lasted only a minute or two. My first thoughts were that there was no one on the mountain who could be out here in the middle of a primitive and protective area. These knocks were from something large and no North American animal could have made them. Listening intently while my mind tried to wrap around how the noise was made, I began to wonder about Bigfoot legends. The night fell silent again. Afterward, I told a few locals and learned that there had been many Bigfoot sightings near Piercy and north of Willow Creek. 
Fast forward to two weeks ago, while waiting at the first locked gate to the same conservation area, I heard two distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained. As I waited in the dusk for about 45 minutes waiting to meet a party at the gate who was running late, I heard a very loud wail, scream or call that I'd never heard before in nature. The sound was coming from the heavily wooded area above me about two to three hundred meters. I instantly knew where I had heard such an unfamiliar call about three years previous. There's a few second delay from the first call, then a few more, then silence for about a minute leading me to wonder if this whole experience was surreal. It thought that it was an unknown animal or some kind of implausible prank. It was loud and echoing down the mountain as though some huge creature could belt with the lungs of Pavarotti, only much louder. The chance of it being a prankster in this wilderness was highly unlikely. Then began another call out at about three to four hundred meters to the north. It was also just as loud but came only three calls in succession. It had a distinct higher pitch. This absolutely blew my mind because the first call might be attributed to an elk on steroids, but the response brought chills down my spine. I'll never forget that second vocalization as it was so unique and this was obviously communication between two individuals in possibly a rudimentary language. Another experience happened just the night before the dual vocalizations on a Friday evening in early November 2019. I had just moved into a cabin that my brother and I rented located along an extremely rugged canyon area of the Maddle River. It was dusk, quite dark already in the forest. I was outside looking at the stars, taking in the newness of these rugged surroundings. Suddenly, there was a screaming that was so loud and so foreboding that I could only listen in amazement. It was the loudest screaming I've ever heard. I thought it was produced by some kind of banshee from a horror film. The screaming continued at full throttle for over five minutes. I know mountain lions can scream, but nothing like this. It sounded much louder, more guttural literally as if someone had set up loudspeakers and played the bloodiest scream that Hollywood could produce. I wondered if someone was up on the mountainside pranking me as a newcomer to the neighborhood. I listened for a bit then went inside and told my brother about it because it was so unnerving. Bigfoot did not ever enter my mind. But then at dusk, the very next evening, I heard two calls while waiting at the gate. I've since been over and over in my mind, why have I been so lucky to hear and experience these mysterious sounds, much less three distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained in a 24-hour period. I've been to a lot of different wilderness areas during my life, but those sounds in that specific location were simply remarkable. I've been searching for answers to this for years, but never found anything like it or that could explain. Basically, I just moved into a new house in a suburban-ish area in northern UK. A few months after we were settled, we invited a friend round for some drinks. At somewhere around 1 a.m., 2 a.m., a very loud sound could be heard throughout the house. The closest thing I can compare it to is microphone feedback. It was very high-pitched and almost hurt to hear except it was more of a defined note than feedback. It started off quietly and was drawn out in the distance, but it sounded like it got progressively closer and louder each time it rung. I say rung because it was like it faded in and out a few times, almost like a long tone. The whole thing lasted only about 20 seconds. Safe to say we were all absolutely freaked out afterwards and had to confirm to each other that we had actually heard it the same. We all brushed it off as too much to drink and some weird electric noise somewhere. Because it was so out of the blue, freaky, and over so quickly nobody thought to record it. A few months later my fiancé and I were in bed. He was asleep by this point and I was trying to get to sleep that's when I heard it again. This time it wasn't as loud, almost as if it didn't come as close, but it sounded as if it was traveling. I woke my fiancé up as I was freaked out again but he was too sleepy to acknowledge anything at this point. The final time it happened was when I was in bed again. This time it woke me up. I didn't bother to wake my fiancé this time as it seemed much quieter this time. Neither of the times when in bed did I have time to record it as I'd have to cross the room to my phone to do so. 
Any ideas what this could be? We've put it down to some kind of electrical sound. It only seems to happen at night or in the early hours of the morning. The first time we heard it confirms that I am not the only one who can hear it. I live on an ordinary street with an office building nearby and a few small shops a street away. The area just outside of here is quite rural. I have also heard about these sky trumpets. However, the sounds I have heard are nothing like any of these. No Google search has yielded any results either. It was just so loud and odd. It's driving me crazy. I just love to have an explanation or even someone who might have experienced something similar. It was on a hot summer night that I was out in the dark woods with my neighbor, whom I'm pretty close with. He was like extended family, honestly. The fact that I didn't even know we were going until that night when I was sitting at home in front of my laptop, playing video games. My neighbor came over to see me, and he asked me if I wanted to go camping with him and his family. It had been a while since we last did anything together, so of course I said yes. It would have just given us an excuse not to go to school for a couple of days. This was in September, so school had just started back up, and the coldness of fall had not yet come, so it was perfect. The next day, his family and I gathered our camping gear. We're driving down a dark road with tall trees on the other side of it. It was getting dark quickly, so we had to turn the lights on, and unfortunately, which means we would have had to set up in the dark, so we're driving for about an hour or two, but it felt like it took forever. My friend's dad turned left at an unmarked intersection where there wasn't even a sign saying that this was the right turn off the road. The road got bumpy and rocky as he drove over this very raw, unpaved road. That's when we came across a large clearing because all I could see around was trees and darkness. Where we stopped at this makeshift campground, I say that because there was no clear indicated spot to set up a tent, a spigot, a bathroom, or anything. This was truly camping just down the middle of nowhere, perfect. Now I need to say that it was pitch blackout, and it had gotten really cold now that the sun had set. We were also higher up in elevation, so we got everything set up quickly and decided we would huddle up in the tent together that my friend's father had set up for us but I just had this feeling lingering within me that we weren't alone. Now my brain was playing tricks on me, so I decided to step out and get some fresh air. It was eerily quiet until I heard this screaming noise. My heart began pounding fast as if it knew what was coming. Then we heard a wrestling noise in the bushes, more screaming from the woods. I was so scared that my friend told me to come back into the tent. Now, not only could we all hear the noises, but then as I got back in the tent and we shined our light, we could see something moving outside the tent, this shape. My friend's dad got a flashlight, shining it too at this object. That's when this thing began screaming and thrashing. Now we're all yelling, freaking out because we can see the shape of this thing more. It looked like an animal, but all we could see was this large shape, and it was terrifying looking from the silhouette. It looked like an upright deformed reindeer or something, and it had long claws. It was where we being pranked. I wasn't even sure. It screamed again in our direction, and we just prayed for it to leave. It walked near our tent, and we all kept our flashlights shining at it through the tent material, only revealing its silhouette. But one thing I noticed is it never came closer to the tent. It's like it was pissed that we set up camp here in its area. I get it. This probably sounds like some sort of amateur creepypasta, but tell it to my family, my friend's family, and me who have to deal with the memory of this thing. We stopped hearing it almost literally after we all pretty much urinated all over our sleeping bags out of terror. Surprisingly, none of us had any weapons on us. Somehow we all forgot. We got lucky that night, but who knows what would have happened if it were to come back and possibly check out our tent. Now, of course, my friend's dad regrets that he didn't bring any weapons. He forgot. He normally always carries a pistol. I went home the next day, and we didn't get any sleep that night. What was designed to be a civil day trip turned into a quick overnight terror. I've not been able to go camping since. I don't think I ever will, you know. 
and I'm also not sure what this thing was or where it came out of. I haven't really sat down to train research either. I don't really care. I just want to get rid of this memory. New York State is known for some pretty crazy things, from alligators in basements to criminals hiding behind trees. But I've had some pretty strange run-ins myself. I'll be telling you about my most interesting encounter yet, about a year ago while on duty at a local town overnight for training. Myself and another officer were dispatched to a local residence for a report of an elderly woman gone missing while hiking with her dog on her own property. She was sitting on roughly 80 acres of land and couldn't have gone far. The person reporting was her son. He said she hadn't been there since later that afternoon when she set out with the dog towards the edge of the property, near the swamp area by their house. It would have been odd to just send two officers on such a call, but due to our small force size, we were using one car on solo nights to provide better coverage across town. Upon arriving on scene, we met with the son, who led us down to where his mother was last seen. He told us he found her phone by their mailbox, which appeared that she had talked to her son for a little while, but after setting out, had mentioned something about going towards the swamp as there were some wildflowers that had bloomed this time of year. This is why we had been dispatched as well. It also seemed like a good spot for bears, so we had to evaluate all the potential dangers. However, knowing how well populated our area was, not everybody always carried bear spray, but we did, so we could cover more ground efficiently and ensure safety if we came across any potentially dangerous wildlife. We walked for about 30 minutes, following the path around to where I thought she may have gone towards. However, after walking for a little while longer, nothing turned up. We then decided to double back and try walking along another path that branched off from the one we were on to see if that would turn up any evidence that she had been here. While walking down this other path at first, it seemed like there was nothing out of the ordinary, but again, no sign of her dog or any tracks leading to the brush, either finishing or somewhere else. This is when I began getting nervous because between myself and my partner, we could not find her or find any traces of her. Something must have happened to her since she left home earlier in the afternoon. As we kept going further, we began hearing odd noises in the distance. While I felt that we were safe at first, we both came to a sudden stop. These sounds were like nothing I've heard before, at least not on this side of the country. But it did not sound like any animal or person I could identify. Did you hear that? My partner had said to me as he looked towards the source of the howl. At this point, my heart was racing out of fear and curiosity, wanting more than anything for this night to end and for us to get back safely. I told him yes as my hands began to tremble slightly, for both nervousness and adrenaline. The hair on my arms were standing and raising, and I felt goosebumps beginning to form. We then slowly began moving towards where the howl had come from, both myself and my partner keeping our flashlights out just in case whatever made the noise was anything dangerous. We walked for another minute or so until we got closer and closer. Still no sign of any dog tracks or even footprints, nothing leading up to this noise or away from it. My heart began pounding out of my chest when we came within about 30 feet of the origin of the sound, which had stopped by now after hearing us get closer. And then suddenly, without warning, an odd orb-like light appeared not too far above our heads, making us feel instantly nauseous. What is that? I remember saying as I raised my flashlight to see what it was, but then, just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished. My partner and myself both looked towards where the light disappeared, and then we heard a rustle from behind us, not too far away from where we were standing. Up until now, he whispered that we needed to get out of here. This wasn't right, but his voice quivered, which was strange and caught my attention. This was a partner who was always very calm no matter how scary or dangerous the situation was. We had been working together for years. However, this time he sounded scared, almost as if something else was out there other than us. We began walking back towards where we came from for a while, while I kept my light out in front of me just to make sure nothing was going to jump out. 
All the while, we had been hearing strange sounds that sometimes sounded like a human, but not fully, at least not having the cadence of a person. It was more animalistic. He would ask me again if I heard that, and I told him yes. He was getting more and more scared, even though his exterior was seemingly calm. We slowly started walking back towards where we came from, where the sounds became louder and louder. This made it difficult to continue without completely freaking out on one another. Then, out of nowhere, the one sound that instantly made me stop in my tracks was the sound of some kind of human cry from not too far away. He whispered SHH to me as he looked at me with his eyes almost piercing right through mine. While I couldn't tell what it was, something compelled me to move forward so we could see what was making these strange sounds around us, which led us here in the first place. Wait, no, come back. We shouldn't be going up this far, he explained to me. But even though he seemed very insistent about us going back the way we came from, I couldn't bring myself to stay quiet and just go while we could still hear all these strange noises where we were. So, while he was busy whispering to me about how we should leave, I began walking towards where it sounded like this noise was coming from, which only made him try and stop me even more. We both proceeded to go deeper into the woods, but the sound of whatever we had heard was now gone, and it was silence. In fact, the night itself was now silent. The crickets' all-night life had gone completely dead. But the inside of my mind was going crazy, trying to figure out what was going on. What were those strange cries and noises? What were the bright lights that appeared overhead? But here's one of the strange parts. At some point, him and I lost each other, which I don't know how it's even possible because we were walking within five to ten feet of one another. I hear him whispering into his radio, trying to contact me, but our radio communication was very fizzy, and somehow we had gotten separated. Joe, come in. Joe, are you out there? He kept saying over and over again, as I could hear what he was saying as if he was standing right next to me, even though we couldn't see each other at all. And as we're struggling in this disarray of a mess, this extremely bright white light shines from the sky, as if an asteroid had exploded up in the atmosphere, lighting up the entire night sky, enveloping me, and I assume my partner, in this white consuming light. And the next thing you know, we're back at the front of the property, and it's morning time with the sun rising. The mom is sitting on her front porch with her dog, drinking coffee. She sees us, and is immediately surprised. My partner and I are kind of looking at each other, freaking out, trying to mentally comprehend everything that has just happened. Feeling ourselves in our own heads and bodies, making sure we're not dead or dreaming. What just happened? I remember asking when the lady comes over to us and begins asking questions like, Where did you guys come from? Why are you here? We began asking her questions in return. Her name, was she aware that she was missing? She seemed to have no knowledge of her ever missing. And when checking the date and time, it had been about 14 hours since the previous evening. My partner and I can both vouch for this happening. I'll spare you all the new details, but long story short, after we had gotten separated by this very thick darkness, we were both enveloped in white light and somehow pushed through about 14 hours of time, ending up at the front of the property. At the time of this happening to us, it was roughly 8.36 p.m. at night, and we were no more than three-fourths of a mile away from the house. The woman who had been reported missing also showed no signs of ever being hurt or any recollection that she was ever missing in the first place. We did not report this, as we have no logical way to explain anything that happened to us. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.